Ladies and gentlemen, um, welcome to this uh, World Economic Forum session on what to expect from a uh, possible Republican administration. Uh, I'm Robin Niblett, um, distinguished fellow with Chatham House, uh, senior advisor now with Hacklett. Um, this is, when they put you in the salon room, you know it's serious. Um, so thank you very much for being part of this uh, uh, session here, um, which is being shared uh, publicly, so this is very much on the record. Um, and uh, what a topic. Um, they had to pick the words fairly carefully uh, in the title in the first place. And I was just talking to the panelists, uh, this great panel, uh, a second ago, just saying we're going to have to, in the very limited time we've got, uh, just make some big assumptions here. Um, just so you know, uh, we're going to assume, obviously, a Republican is one, because that's in the title. Um, and I think uh, uh, we've agreed amongst ourselves that we think we know who's probably likely to win the, win the nomination uh, if that takes place. Uh, so I'll let folks uh, uh, work on that assumption, but maybe add in some, on the other hand, if. Uh, uh, not least, as I'll mention in a minute, we've got uh, different interests here on the panel as to who maybe uh, should win. Um, so uh, what I let me do first is just introduce who we've got so you've got a feel of the spread. And we're going to try and cover as much as we can in the time. Um, I'm going to make sure we've got 10 minutes uh, towards the end for you to ask questions. So anything we've not been able to cover, um, uh, colleagues here on the panel, um, ho hopefully you'll have a chance uh, either to do it in the answer to a question or shoehorn it in there however you can. Um, a wonderful panel. Um, starting to my left, and I may actually, I've kind of pretty much done it the way uh, it is here. Uh, uh, former Senator Rob Portman, now chair of the Portman Centre for Policy Solutions. Uh, Two-term U.S. Senator through to 2023, uh, six terms in the House of Representatives, served in the uh, George W. Bush and G. H. W. Bush uh, administrations, um, and uh, he's uh, also, I think importantly to mention in terms of this conversation, uh, was one of the uh, founders, well, the founder of the Ukraine uh, Senate caucus. So welcome, uh, Senator Portman. Hey, Father. Great to have you here, you Rob, from now on. Uh, Dr. Kevin Roberts, who is the president uh, of the Heritage Foundation since October 2021. It's almost like you've come in getting ready for this push uh, through to the 24 election. Um, he, prior to this, he was the CEO of the Texas Public Policy Foundation. Um, Heritage have published since 1979, certainly it came out in 81, this mandate for leadership. And I think it's out already. I was skimming it, so it is, that's the final version. There is a mandate for leadership, uh, and they have quite a track record of what Republican administrations take on when it's there. So I suggest you take a look at it. If you can, it's on their website. Um, Professor Walter Russell Mead, a uh, distinguished fellow um, on strategy and statesmanship at the Hudson Institute. I'm gonna call it a conservative uh, think tank. Um, you can take me on, Walter, if you want later on that one. Um, Professor at Bard College, which doesn't strike me as very conservative, um, uh, but spent uh, 12 years at the Council on Foreign Relations uh, as a, a senior fellow there. I'm just going to say he's a renowned author and um, a regular columnist as well and um, wonderful colleague and looking forward to his viewpoints on this, as I am everyone's. Dr. Alison Schrager, Senior Fellow at the Manhattan Institute for Policy Research, uh, an economist, which means she has to cover, as we were discussing a minute ago, a lot of things uh, under that title. Um, a columnist at Bloomberg, specialised in public finance, tax policy, labour markets, all things I think we will get into uh, in this session. And Jerry Baker, uh, editor at large now for the Wall Street Journal, was the uh, editor in chief, uh, used to write for the Times, uh, writes a regular week weekly column, Free Expression, uh, for the Wall Street Journal. Um, and I think it's a weekly uh, show on Fox Business. Uh, podcast. No, it's a podcast now. It's just, podcast. Uh, just a podcast. Okay. Yeah. Well, it's a show still, if yeah, it's exactly. a podcast. Um, but uh, Jerry, as we were discussing earlier, uh, he covers anything. So, Jerry, um, uh, we're wonderful to have you there. He is an American citizen, but I said I'm going to treat him as the honorary um, person who will at least bring that perspective of, of, like me, I suppose, interested in many people in this room as to what's going to happen. So, having that got out the way uh, very quickly, I want to just ask, um, I think, a very fundamental question. Even if you take the a prioris we've put in place here that it's likely to be, if it's a Republican administration, uh, a second Trump term in the White House, there's still a question of who controls the Senate and the House. And that'd be a pretty important thing, as we know from any administration in the United States. So, Rob, I'm going to turn to you, <laughs> um, I think quite logically, uh, to just give us your sense, all, colleagues, all of you, 
going to have to be really punchy with our answers, um, and I'll start doing that if, uh, if, if anyone goes on for too long. But what's your take uh, looking ahead and assuming it is a Republican administration that's in there? That probably tells you something about maybe what would have happened in the Senate and the House. But over to you, Rob. Well, thanks, Robin. I appreciate it. Uh, I, I'm uh, coming from a congressional bias here, having served for 24 years in the House and Senate. But I do think it's important uh, for a few reasons. One, um, it represents the voice of the people uh, to, a, to a large extent. Uh, that is something that needs to be considered. But also, with regard to policy, um, and I would look at immigration policy as an example, um, it's important to change laws. So when President Trump came in, he, through executive order, made a number of changes which helped secure the southern border of the United States. Those changes were uh, immediately uh, changed again when the new administration came in because it was not a matter of law, it was a matter of, of executive action. And it shows the importance of having uh, legal changes, uh, things like asylum policy, uh, parole, um, you know, even in terms of some of the funding decisions. Um, uh, there are a lot of other ex examples of that, uh, but an important one, of course, would be if the president wants to get at the issues of debt and deficit and taxes, those would have to be uh, legislated. So it's important. What's going to happen? Uh, I don't have the crystal ball, and so was, Mike, so much of what we're going to talk about today, it's unpredictable. But I think if, uh, if a Republican wins, more than likely at least one House will become Republican. I think it's likely the Senate will become Republican. It's very close right now. It's two votes, and there are probably two or three states that are now leaning Republican uh, that would make the difference. The House, I think it's really up in the air. Uh, there are about 18 House members, I think, on the Republican side who are in districts that Joe Biden won, so it's possible you could have a split where one's Republican, one's Democrat. Even if the Senate is 51 Republican, of course, it takes 60 votes to do almost anything, including uh, the immigration policies we just talked about. So it matters, mm. and that's something to, to be watched. But I think if President Trump were to win, or if Nikki Haley were to win, any Republican, likely the, the Senate would switch. Uh, not so sure in the House. That's interesting, yeah. Um, that it would flip back from, uh, from that situation to the one we have now to almost the opposite. Yeah. Do you think it's more important for, a, for an administration to have the Senate or the House? Senate, of course. I'm a senator. <laughs> no, I, you know, the, the other issue that I, I was going to touch on earlier in terms of the importance, the third one is, is people. You know, uh, having served in two White Houses and from the inside viewed how important the people the president surrounds him or herself, herself with is incredibly important, right? And so you have to go through a confirmation process for about 2,000 of those. And it's possible to pick acting people, but again, that has some negative consequences to it. They can only serve for a limited period of time. And and don't have the stature. So, yeah, having the Senate is very important because that's the personnel office. You know, the Senate is the only one that, will conf that confirms people. I mean, more important. using our assumptions as we are, it is possible, uh, to now to you, Kevin, that um, even uh, a Trump administration may not have won the popular vote. I'll say it is likely whoever wins, <laughs> people are going to be c contesting and feeling angry. So, therefore, that 60 vote mm -hmm. margin becomes quite an important uh, element for all these questions. Let me ask you a quick question because I was going to bring to this. You said personnel. This is just a snappy, what's the gossip? Um, on, the, on the domestic side, you know, if a Trump administration comes in this time, it's they've been preparing for it. Now, you've been helping them <laughs> prepare uh, the Republican Party to prepare for this in a way that it was not prepared uh, in... Uh, uh, 2017. Um, so could you tell me what kinds of people, and if you've got some names, put them out there, um, do you think might be the kinds of people uh, that a tr Trump administration, we're using that assumption, would pull in on the big domestic agenda elements from chief of staff, treasury, maybe national security, I know, well, maybe I should leave that for Walter, I'm coming to you in a minute on that, but on the domestic side, you know, are there people all lining up, is there a community out there thinking, right, this is the opportunity, we've got to get it right, what kind of people do you think would be stepping forward? There are. I, I will disappoint you, Robin, and not mention names. That's ultimately up to the president-elect and, and his or her staff, right? So I won't be presumptuous. But I will say the kind of person. The kind of person, and I'll be candid here because I think I've been invited here to be candid. The kind of person who will come into the next conservative administration is going to be governed by one principle, and that is destroying the grasp that political elites and unelected technocrats have over the average person. And if I may... I will be candid and say that the agenda that every single member of the administration needs to have is to compile a list of everything that's ever been proposed at the World Economic Forum <laughs> and object all of them wholesale. Anyone not prepared to do that and take away this power of the unelected bureaucrats and give it back to the American people is unprepared to be part of the next conservative administration. Okay, that's very clear. And as you said, you... Uh 
I think uh, one of your tweets on the lead up to here was also uh, that you're here to usher the devoisie into early retirement. So um, I'm heading that way already, so I'm probably all right on that front. But uh, thank you, and we appreciate your candor and being candid. Otherwise, this panel uh, is not going to make sense. So thank you very much for that. And, and goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> similar kind of thing. We might all be ushered on this panel. We might be ushered out. Um, uh, Walter, just something on the foreign policy side again about the types of people. You heard what Kevin said about the domestic agenda. Really wholesale change. We'll get it right this time, if you know what I'm saying. You're not going to be able to remake the issue. Mm. Do you think that attitude would prevail as well on the foreign policy side? There are names that are out there already as potentially playing a role in this. Well, I'm also going to abstain from, from naming names. Uh, but I do think that you will see a determination to sort of follow through on things that were begun the last time. Uh, my guess is that the discussion on NATO will be very central um, and that the 2% the, um, will be key um, and that um, uh, Trump uh, will, will, will focus hard on that right from the beginning. Um, he does not, uh, he's not interested in this sort of legal, bureaucratic, administrative forms of diplomacy, which are kind of at the heart of the European Union method of doing business. And he's not interested, in, in a sense, in the EU, the idea is each decision that we've made becomes a, fa a framework within which we move. I think Trump has no problems with uh, just starting from the beginning. Uh, he tends to see negotiations as principle to principle rather than bureaucracy to bureaucracy. So in, in that sense, think of, you know, Lorenzo of, of Florence and Lorenzo Medici negotiating with the Duke of Milan, the Sforza. You know, it's v much more in that way. And he has a very personal bargaining style. He's going to get, have people around him who are comfortable in advancing that approach. So that's, uh, I'm thinking of my European colleagues here thinking about who on the European side is going to be able to fit that Lorenzo Medici kind of uh, profile. And in any case, I'm not going to make any comments about people at the moment, but that's, that'd be quite an interesting challenge. And when you think of what the mix of European leaders, either institutions or governments are, and yep. are all leaders around, we'll be thinking very carefully, we'll need a different style. Thank yep. you very much. Um, Alison, let me come to you. Maybe we could get a little bit into the substance here now, uh, as I'm coming to you and I'm keeping an eye on time. Um, what do you think on the domestic economic agenda would be top of the entree uh, for a Republican administration? And we're assuming it's a Trump administration, but fold it if you want into something a bit bigger as well. Well, I mean, if it's Nikki Haley, I think we have a lot more predictability. She's been pretty clear. And also, I think, consistent with Republicans in the past. It would be very sort of Reagan, maybe George H.W. Bush era. So I think we, we kind of know what that would mean. I think with Trump, there's definitely a lot more unpredictability. But based on the last administration, I guess we have some insight. A lot of it, when it comes to economics, execution is very important. So who he surrounds himself with is going to be super important, because certainly when it comes to things like tax policy, the devil's in the details. Um, you, you're not going to give any names either. The kinds of people who are advising the... the if it's no one Who's here, advising the campaign, yeah. at least? Um, if it's no one here, again, it'll be a little bit more unpredictable, but I think we can assume... You know, on the one hand, I, I've been thinking about this. You know, he is definitely not a big trade guy compared to traditional Republicans. On the other hand, I mean, we got to think about where we are right now. I mean, in a lot of ways, things like the um, IRA and a lot of the industrial policy from the Biden administration has not been particularly trade friendly. A lot of it would call protectionism by another name. So um, I don't know if he would reverse that or just not do more of that. So from that perspective, any way he might talk a good game about trade, it might be more trade friendly than what we have now. Um, and that's something. Um, uh, so, I mean, I guess the, the other thing I see him going after very quickly is immigration, because, I mean, this is what made his first campaign, and this has been a big problem for the Biden administration. Um, uh, as Rob pointed out, I mean, it'll probably be through executive order. I mean, in theory, I mean, I'm someone who personally, more than anyone who would be in the Trump administration, is pro-immigration. But uh, I also agree what's happening on the border right now is a lot of chaos and is probably holding up good immigration reform. So I suppose maybe if he can bring more order to the border, maybe in the future something good will happen. Um, 
And then, I mean, my other concern is some of this stuff I worry could be inflationary, uh, particularly uh, bullying the Fed uh, to cut rates before it's time, or particularly if we have more supply shocks. Um, or as I said, if there is a pullback on trade or less immigration, we could end up with more with inflation coming back. What, what control does the president have over uh, the Fed uh, appointments, all of that kind of stuff? I, 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 I don't know. Maybe many people in the room here don't know. I'm sure some do. Because well, it's supposed to be independent, um, but um, he can choose to um, appoint or reappoint Powell. Um, I think we, we already saw one issue. I mean. People say um, that one of the reasons the Fed was so slow to act on inflation under the Biden administration was that Powell was waiting um, to get reappointed. So, I mean, I don't know <laughs> well, if that's Well, it just gets true. in there now and again. Okay, yeah. yeah. Um, so, I mean, anyway, it's supposed to be independent. There is interaction with politics. And uh, Trump, on the last administration, very much wanted low rates. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we might be in a regime that, you know, has higher rates. So, I mean, in the end, that could end up being inflationary. But we'll see. Uh, Jerry, Jerry, maybe we could stay a little bit on the economic side because you can range on both sides of, of, of the ledger. But, uh, you know, U.S. debt to GDP, I mean, the last figure I looked at was 125%, something like that. Um, it's a pretty big number. Mm. It's one of the issues Republicans keep pointing out, uh, saying we want to cut back the spending, we want to cut, cut, cut. But this is a president who, I don't know, doesn't seem to be very orthodox about these things. He kind of wants to have his cake and eat it. Um, so what's your sense as well on that side? Is that going to be a constraint on what a new Republican administration may or may not be able to do? So, I mean, um, so far, I mean, obviously under Trump, the deficit increased dramatically too. Uh, it was largely tax cuts, obviously under Trump, and then spending under Biden. So, But I, if you don't mind, uh, given that we have limited time, uh, Robin, I, just, I, I want to address something slightly different, well, very different. And I'm struck that we've been here for 20 minutes talking about the next Trump administration especially in a room like this and with everybody's minds, I'm sure, and nobody's yet mentioned the D word, dictator, right? This is what the, is on everybody's mind right now, that we're about to enter an American dictatorship. I was amused to listen to Walter's very erudite uh, um, uh, account of uh, Lorenzo Medici. I think that you know, there's, a, there's an Italian of more recent vintage uh, who many th people think... Uh, might be sort of Donald, Donald Trump's role model, uh, Il Duce. Um, and I, I just wanted to take that on because, it, because, because I think it is a, it's, a, it's a legitimate question. It's a real question. We saw what Trump did after the 2020 election and the way in which he did if it essentially uh, try to subvert the Constitution there. And I think it's a genuine question of whether or not um, this is going to characterise uh, his next uh, the, the, the second Trump administration, whether America really is going to move in a significant way uh, departing from Republican democracy. I, I tend to be a little bit sceptical and a little bit, I, maybe I'm complacent and maybe it's because I'm a relatively new American. I feel optimistic about the country and this is a country of, of laws and not men, famously. I'm a little bit sceptical. But I will say this, look, Trump, Trump does, we were going to talk about retribution too. Trump, Trump, Trump talks a lot about retribution. Trump, is, there is absolutely no question, I think, everybody here would have to acknowledge that Trump's instincts are certainly not what one might call in line with traditional constraints of Republican democracy. I, he just put out a statement today, but some of you may have seen it. Uh, he's actually, as you know, he's facing these various uh, legal cases, and, and part of one of his defenses is going to be, is one, which this is a case that's going to be heard by the Supreme Court, is whether or not a president has immunity for any action any action that he uh, takes in office, complete legal immunity for any action. And just to, you know, just to just give you more of a flavor of, 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 obviously, of the man, he put out a statement today saying, a president of the United States must have full immunity without which it will be impossible for him to, or her to properly function. Any mistake, even if well intended, would be met with almost certain indictment by the opposing party at term end. Even events that, quote, unquote, cross the line must fall under total immunity. So, uh, <laughs> this is, so th again, we know, this is, this is, we, we know enough about Trump now, and he's, yep. he's spelling it out for us. My, just very briefly, my, uh, again, I, I think this, these concerns are reasonable, fair, given what we've seen of Trump. However, again, I do ask you all to remember that America is, uh, it, it is a constitutional democracy. Uh, it is subject to the rule of law. And, you know, I, I talk to people like this, oh, well, you know, all his Supreme, he's appointed all these just, ju judges last time, and he's appointed, you know, uh, he's got a Supreme Court majority, which is in his favour. Well, actually, that's not, that's, that's way too simplistic. Uh, in fact, that Supreme Court declined to hear any cases that, he, that were brought uh, in the wake of the 2020 election, and I don't think you should assume at all that this Supreme Court 
however much of a conservative majority it has on it, will rubber stamp anything that Trump tries to do. So, again, while I think it's absolutely reasonable to be concerned about Trump's character, about his personality, about this kind of thing, about the way he sees the, the, the rather expansive idea he has about the, uh, the, uh, the role of the executive and his particular the role of the, president, the presidency, and we should be concerned about that, and Americans should be concerned, and the rest of the world should be watching it. I wouldn't get carried away with uh, this idea that uh, that it's either you know sort of Germany 1933 yeah. or Italy 1923 sure. that we're in, in uh, America 2024. No, and um, um, good thing you you raised it, Jerry, because uh, I said something we talked about before that we bring up, and, and let's me come back, Kevin. Let me come to you because I said I wanted. It's quite good in the way that Jerry set it up. What did the president, what do you think, uh, a President Trump, he's the president from being the former president, but if there were a new President Trump, what uh, does he mean by retribution? Uh, what is the issue calling out very specifically, a former attorney general and former chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and so on? I mean, it, it sounds very personal. Um, and you said yourself a minute ago, anyone who's kind of not with the program is not going to be in, in an administration. Um, you know, one thing that Davos, you might say, and the people come here stand up for is liberal democracy. So if the idea that's going to be swept under the table is part of the idea, hopefully that's not what he means. What do you mean, what do you think he means by retribution? Well, it's laughable that you would, or anyone would describe Davos as protecting liberal democracy. It's equally, Standing up for it. <clears throat> it's, it's, it's equally laughable to use the word dictatorship at Davos and, and aim that at President Trump. In fact, I think that's absurd. But I'm going to step aside from that constructive criticism and instead answer your question. Yep. And, and I'm going to be substantive here. President Trump, if he's the next president, for that matter, I think whoever the next conservative president is going to take on the power of the elites, which I mentioned earlier. But there, the, the thing that I want to drive home here, the very reason that I'm here at Davos, is to explain to many people in this room and who are watching, with all due respect, nothing personal, but that you're part of the problem. Political elites tell the average people on three or four or five issues that the reality is X, when in fact reality is Y. Take immigration. Elites tell us that open borders and even illegal immigration are okay. The average person tells us in the United States that both rob them of the American way of life. They're right. President Trump will take that on on behalf of the average American. Elites also tell us that public safety isn't a problem in big American cities just travel to New York or Washington or Dallas, Texas, the average person will tell you that the lack of public safety damages not just the American way of life, but their life. President Trump will take that on. Thirdly, I guess the favorite at the World Economic Forum is climate change. Elites tell us that we, we have this existential crisis with so-called climate change, so much so that climate alarmism is probably the greatest cause for mental health crisis in the world. The solutions the average person know ba based on climate change are far worse and more harmful and cost more human lives, especially in Europe during the time that you need heating than do the problem and the problems themselves. Fourth, two more here, Robin. Okay. The fourth, China. The number one adversary, not just to the United States, but to free people on planet Earth, not only do we at, at Davos not say that? We give the Chinese Communist Party a platform. Count on President Trump ending that nonsense. And fifth, as we sit here, another supranational organization, the World Health Organization, is discussing foisting gender ideology upon the global south. These are practices that are under review, if not being rejected, by countries in Northern Europe. The new president, especially if it's President Trump, will, as you like to say, trust the science. He will understand the basic biological reality of manhood and womanhood. And do you know why? Not because of retribution, not because he's a dictator, but because he has the power of the American people behind him. And it's connected to Senator Portman's excellent point that in addition to needing a vigorous executive, we look forward to having the popular will inform both the House and Senate in 2025 to pass laws on all of those issues and many others. Ultimately, Robin, I think President Trump, if in fact he wins a second term, is going to be inspired by the wise words of Javier Millet, who said that he was in power not to guide sheep, but to awaken lions. That's what the average American and the average free person on planet Earth wants out of leaders.
very clear points, and I'll give a chance for everyone to come back, including on the Q&A and uh, any particular issues they want to challenge. The one thing I will challenge, we can come back to it later on, Kevin, is what will be the mandate of the American people if, A, the mandate tends to be a pop not a plurality of the vote? If, if he and wins the election, the country. mandate's clear. Kevin keeps saying if he wins the election. Can I ask, Kevin, is there any conceivable way in which if he win loses the election, he will accept that he's lost the election, or, would you add, or whether you would accept that? What was the last part? Do you accept, would you accept if he loses the election that he's lost the election, or would if, it be like if, last if time? We're, if we're sure that there's election integrity, but I'm not sure that we can be. Well, yeah, we're not, <laughs> so, we're, I think you've answered my question there. We're, we're, yes, we're, not, we're not going to get to the end of that one, so park that one for the moment. I want to first bring in Rob, uh, then I'll come to you, uh, Walter, and then we'll go on. Rob, I, I was going to go around with you to the issue of, of trade and so on. Yeah. I want you to say something about that, but first to pick up again one of the points that Jerry mentioned, and maybe it ties into I think, some of Kevin's points, uh, states. I mean, the, there is a palpable concern, and I'm speaking now as a non-American, uh, but people are very interested in the future of America. I've heard the term kind of civil war. You know, The fact that there was uh, an assault on uh, Capitol Hill, January 6, 2021, um, you know, there's a lot of weapons. Uh, states may have a different view of the outcome of the election, either way, whichever way it goes. It, you know, getting to the point that Jerry mentioned earlier about what makes up America, <laughs> where the power lies um, between the Congress and states, do you think states may end up playing a very important role in a Trump uh, administration if they are democratic control states and for whatever reason decide that a radical agenda that, as Kevin said, is very convinced of its correctness, but maybe representing 50% of Americans, you know, are you worried that we're heading to something really existential? Because I think that's certainly a concern I hear a lot. Mm -hmm. Let me start with trade and build on what Allison said, because I think she's, she's right. But let me give a, a, some very specific examples. Uh, there might be some surprise uh, globally about what the Trump trade agenda is, because you recall he actually completed the U.S.-Mexico, the USMCA agreement, which was the new NAFTA agreement. Uh, and that template actually was accepted not just by... Uh, the corporate elite, uh, but also by trade unions, uh, because it helped protect American workers and helped provide uh, some more of a level playing field between our two largest trading partners, Canada and Mexico. I'm a former U.S. trade representative. I believe in trade, but I believe it needs to be level playing field. And that for years, the United States, particularly vis-a-vis -vis China, has been naive uh, about trade. You think about it, he not only did that, he got four-fifths of the way there on the U.K. agreement. And if there are any uh, uh, of our UK brethren here, they will tell you that they're ready to go. Um, and so are a lot of other countries. And every country represented in this room has done more in terms of trade agreements over the last four years than the United States have. You know, in this administration, we've decided to pull back not a single trade agreement, even with countries that begged us for it, who would really help on a geopolitical basis, like Ecuador, let's say, uh, or Taiwan for that, that matter. Uh, so I, I think that it's, it's interesting because people just believe instinctively he'll be more protectionist. He may be in some regards, uh, particularly with regard to tariffs. But in terms of establishing trade agreements that are free trade agreements that then help not just create more trade but reform economies, he actually has a track record of wanting to do that, whereas the current administration do, does not. So that's interesting. Okay. Second, uh, we haven't talked at all today about the fact that this will be one term unless there's an attempt to change the Constitution, which I don't think there would be. Uh, so uh, that's very different for the American political scene, because you know in the first term, presidents are looking to what? Get reelected, particularly in the last uh, three and four years. And that second term typically is when they, they take a few more chances, right? And so things like debt and deficit, uh, things like you know the, the kind of actions you have to take on, on the border to really make a difference, things like trade. I mean, I think there might be a little different attitude, and that's not unhealthy in my view, not that I'm for not only having one four-year term for presidents, but maybe one six-year term would make sense because it seems like the re-election is so important in that, in that first term. That's something you think about. And then your, your final question, I mean, look, I'm, I'm, I'm an optimist. I think our constitutional protections worked uh, ultimately on January 6th. I thought January 6th was horrific. I thought it was a bad day for American democracy. But what happened? Uh, the Senate came back into session that very night, certified the votes. Uh, you know, our founders had it right. And we do have a lot of Rule of law means something in, in, in our country, and we do have a, a lot of constraints, um, yep. and including on the states, yep. in terms of how, how the states might, might respond to federal actions that they don't agree with. So I'm less concerned about that. Okay. So you think that the balance would hold? Walter, I know you, we wanted to come in for a while, so just come in on whatever point you put your hand up for before, and that'll keep the, the flow going. All right. Well, I just wanted to sharpen the, uh, the trade discussion a bit and, and maybe 
sort of highlight a, a, where there might well be a, a U.S.-European divide under a, a Trump administration. And we haven't used, we hadn't talked about the D word, we also haven't talked about the G word much, green, that, that I think Trump, uh, a Trump administration would probably withdraw from the Paris Accords. I suspect that the IRA, uh, a Trump administration, would carve the green stuff out of the IRA and replace that with other forms of support for other American industries. Um, that, you know, and, and I think that's, that's actually a quite real um, a possibility that maybe some have discounted. Um, I could also see a real fight. The, the European Union has sort of said, well, you know, what, what is our power? We don't have much in the way of an army. We don't have, you know, there are a lot of things we don't have. What we do have is a consumer market. And so we will use the power of our consumer market to sort of reg externalize European values, European approaches, green tariffs, however we call them, would be a piece of that. I would think Trump would, a Trump administration might well say that's grounds for a trade war and welcome it mm -hmm. um, and fight it probably much harder than, than Europeans might expect. And, and might be quite willing for that to go on. And it would become then an objective of the Trump administration to prevent the EU from in line with some of the things you were saying, uh, to prevent the EU from exporting its vision of a rule of law to American uh, companies. Um, no, very important point to raise. And Alison, let, let me come to you in a minute because there's been reasonably good coordination between uh, the United States, European countries, the EU, Japan, South Korea, others, on issues like export controls, investment controls. Where do you think a, a Trump administration would go in its thinking with this? They, in a way, they kicked it off, and the Biden administration followed along uh, with taking that much tougher line uh, uh, on China. But could this then be applied potentially to other parts of the world? The EU is running a big uh, surplus right now uh, with the US, which is going to be noted very much under a Trump administration. I mean. I'm, I mean, I'm, it, it's hard to know. I mean, there's a lot of unpredictability there. I mean, there were a lot of reasons he was particularly concerned about China. If nothing else, it looms very large in the public eye. It, it becomes such a big trading partner. It becomes associated with sort of um, eliminating a lot of jobs, stealing a lot of IP. Uh, you know, no other country is really looming as large in Americans' minds as having unfair trade. So. Um, I wouldn't expect that, but again, it, it really could come down to who he surrounds himself with or if he feels like that changes. Um, I, think, I think Rob's right that you know, he, in some ways he does like to make deals. We do know that about him. Mm -hmm. So um, he could be more inclined to make more trade deals. Um, so right. that would be the hope. Uh, Jerry, on, on foreign policy, um, Ukraine. I mean, let's just, we've got two <coughs> minutes, so I'm going to turn to the audience. So just have your questions ready, but let's just get a few ideas from you on the table. On Ukraine, wh wh what's your call? Um, I think uh, support for what the US, for, for US uh, financial assistance and military assistance to Ukraine is ebbing rapidly in the United States. Heavily, obviously, on, among conservatives on the right, but you're seeing that uh, there's a big continuing question mark over whether this, whether this extra allocation uh, gets through the Congress. So I think that is. That is, I'm sorry, you know, again... A Does that apply to military and uh, uh, financial, if you see certainly, what I'm saying? That's certainly, to mili distinction. certainly to military. I think, and again, look, I think there are, again, I don't want... There, are, there, are, there, is a, there is a combination of rising pessimism, if you like, about where the Ukrainian effort is actually going and focus on domestic issues. And, and, and you know, to Kim, I mean, everybody's talked about this. I mean, the immigration, the situation in immigration in the United States is absolutely appalling. It's, it's just a scandal. And it is, and, and I think finally, dem even some Democrats are starting to wake up to this. And I think there is, the, the, the border is out of control. And I think there is going to be a strong demand to do something about it. But just very briefly, Robin, I'll take it and broaden the question out from Ukraine about NATO. Because the other thing that I keep getting everybody I talk to here thinks if Trump wins, it's basically the end of NATO. Because the US, Trump, you know, they've heard what he said about NATO. They know that he has a bit of an affinity for Vladimir Putin and Russia. And they also see the broad tides of American strategic attention heading to Asia, Pacific, anyway, you know, NATO's finished. I wouldn't be so sure. I mean, of course I understand the thinking behind that. 
and people listen to what Trump says and think that's the end. They say, but you know, and they saw what he did, and they remember the famous incident that John Bolton, you know, likes to tell of when he was at a NATO summit and Trump nearly pulled America out of NATO at a, in, a, in, a, in a fit of peak in the middle of a NATO summit. I wouldn't be quite so sure. It was very, it's very interesting because Trump, if you listen to Trump now when he talks about NATO, in fact, he gave a town hall in Iowa a couple of weeks ago. He actually now claims NATO as a victory for him, as a success. And by the way, I don't think he's necessarily wrong about that. He says, you know, every American president, you know, since Eisenhower has wanted the U.S. demand, asked the Europeans to do more, to contribute more in their own defense. It's outrageous that the United States carries is the burden sharing issue is, is, is intolerable for the United States. And I'm the first president who's actually got them to do it. I've actually woken them up. They've actually done it. I, that's a great... So he talks about having, you know, having succeeded in, in actually revitalizing NATO by getting... Now, again, we can all argue about what exactly, how much the Europeans really are doing in terms of increasing their contributions to NATO. But so I, I just, again, given the way... I, one final point, uh, Robin, too, which is that there's an unpredictability about Trump. And everything we say that oh, there's an uncertainty about politics and policy generally, um, Kevin's uh, at Heritage Foundation have been working very, very energetically, I know, on, on helping, you know, to produce a kind of a blueprint for, for, the, for a second Trump administration. And I think it will be much more coherent than it was than the first Trump administration in terms of personnel, in terms of policy. You know, tr frankly, Trump sort of, you know, picked a lot of people who he'd just seen on Fox News and quite liked to do serious jobs in his administration. I think that won't happen this time. But no, I'm not, I'm, I'm, that's not a joke. I mean, that's, I'm, that's literally, literally how, we, how some of those se senior positions were filled. Yep. There's going to be a much more serious, coherent approach this time. But I would not necessarily... Just as a... I think, yep. it's, I think you can rest assured, maybe, that we're not facing a dictatorship yep. after November. I wouldn't necessarily think that NATO is dead either. Mm. And the other thing, of course, he's got to do... The, the largest source of uh, LNG right now in Europe is from America. And that was his big other complaint. So he's kind of one on two as things. Let, let me give you one last chance to come back on this, uh, Kevin, and then I'm going to take it out for the questions. W what do you take on the foreign policy agenda on Ukraine? What's your view of this? And China, which you, you mentioned it in your list. But if you have it in the list, uh, uh, and let me just say one thing that WEF stands up for very strongly is... Ukraine and its right to exist and, and defend itself. So if that's something you think also needs to be swept away, let us know, yeah? Um, but uh, uh, on China as well, what would be done differently, if you see what I'm saying? Ukraine and China. Uh, let me <clears throat> just correct the, uh, the slight assertion you made there. We want Ukraine to win. We want to see Ukraine win with a lot more help from European allies. I think the United States has a role. Heritage has been clear about this for two years now that we, there is a world in which we support military aid for Ukraine. I think the entire American right would, or almost all of them, provided it's 100% focused on military aid. There is real transparency in how the funds are used. And it's just a fact, this is not conveyed pejoratively. If you look at our index of economic freedom at Heritage, Ukraine's in the bottom 10 on government transparency. We don't celebrate that, we wish that were different, but the transparency concern, which the political right has voiced from the beginning, is real. Thirdly, it, it actually needs to have a strategic end game. And the President of the United States, Joe Biden, has done a god-awful job in articulating what that is, particularly from the standpoint of what's in the best interest of Americans. Those two issues are very much linked, but not in the way the conversation goes here at the World Economic Forum. That is to say that from the perspective of the United States, because our first obligation in foreign policy is to look at it through the lens of what's best for the American citizen, the much bigger threat is the Chinese Communist Party. And not just because of their imminent threats or their threats for imminent action against Taiwan, especially after the outcome of Saturday's election, but because the Chinese are a far greater economic power, and I would even argue cultural power, in the world, not just in the United States. Therefore, we would argue, to, to sum up here, Robin, for the next conservative president to be a prioritizer. It's not an either-or question, and too much of the media commentary is, puts that as a, as a false choice, it's not. It's, it's a matter of realizing this fact. This year, as no doubt the great fiscal senator Rob Portman would know, the United States is going to pay three quarters of a trillion dollars in interest alone. I'm telling you from the standpoint of the American political center right, that has to change before European countries, especially in Germany and France, wag their finger about what we're supposed to do on their behalf. Great, thank you very much, very clear again. Right, let's get some questions in. I'm gonna take a little group. I have this horrible <coughs> feeling people are gonna be shy because um, I'm not seeing hands shoot up. Any hands shooting up here? Anyone got a question? I'm gonna start 
if I know somebody, I'm going to call on you, but I'm not sure who I know here. Right. Um, no? Okay. In that case, we'll keep going round on our, on our own track. But if you have any questions, I'll think of one in a minute, please. Oh, can uh, I say something? Sorry? Or is, yeah, is someone's going to we show a question? Oh, good. A, a question, you. perhaps, uh, okay. for Mr. Roberts. So, day one of the Trump presidency, what does he do? What are the first two or three actions that he does? Thanks for the question. As soon as what I hope is a very brief inaugural address concludes, and brief not because what would be in it would be unwise, quite the opposite, <laughs> but because our country's on fire, there needs to be pushing through Schedule F civil service reform so that the president can fire a good number of the unelected bureaucrats in the administrative state. The administrative state's the greatest threat to democracy in the United States, and we need to end it. The second thing is he needs to really confront all of the policies surrounding so-called climate change. We've had a great discussion here by Walter and Allison, who are excellent on that point, about focusing on fiscal policies that have nothing to do with wrongheaded and really harmful subsidies of wind and solar. We love wind and solar energy at Heritage. We just want them to stand on their own in the free market. And because that affects human prosperity, more than a billion people in the world have been lifted out of poverty in the last 35 years because of fossil fuels. The president is going to take that on. And the third thing that he's going to do, I think, and, and this would be a bit of a departure from his last administration, when he spent too much money, is really be focused on fiscal restraint. S because we simply can't afford it. It's something that transcends the political left and the political right. And I can certainly tell you from the standpoint of heritage, and all of us at Project 2025 will be zealously supportive of all three of those actions. Alison, let me bring you in here. Where do you think those cuts would come from? I well, mean, if that, we're going <laughs> to... Well, that, that's what I wanted to say is, I mean, I, I'm concerned that um, he wouldn't be very fiscally responsible. I mean, first of all, he's already been very clear that he's not going to touch entitlements, which is honestly the big driver so of our debt. Cut entitlements. Yeah, which is the big driver of our debt going forward. Um, and, you know, I, I expect he would renew uh, the tax cuts that he put in in 2017. I, I actually like a lot of aspects of them, so I'm not saying that's bad, but I'm saying I, I wish he had done them in a more deficit-neutral way, and I don't expect him to do that. So um, I think we can expect he, – he doesn't seem like someone who has a problem with debt, um, although, you know, maybe uh, – so I do, I do anticipate um, sort of bigger debts anyway. I mean, he maybe might cut some subsidies and propping up some industries. Stop paying the interest rate on, on the debt. That would be interesting. That could be a, a particular option. Uh, Walter, you've heard quite a bit on the, on the foreign policy side as well. Um, China, Ukraine, what are your thoughts on that? Then I'm going to come to Rob as well on, on the, some of these bigger in, topics. I think Trump will, uh, uh, President Trump is likely to shock people by the number of deals he's willing to entertain. Unlike, uh, again, a lot of classic diplomacy, uh, Trump is, is ready to, uh, you know, we saw what he did with North Korea, or at least began with North Korea. In fact, one place where you'll find a pocket of strong support for, for Trump today is on the left in South Korea, where they really thought his innovative approach to North Korea was, was helpful. So I could well see a Trump administration sending an envoy to Iran and saying, okay, what's the deal? Uh, certainly, would I wouldn't be surprised to see it happen with Russia, with China, um, and everything would be on the table at least figuratively. Um, Trump is someone. Uh, I think this is if you read the Art of the Deal, which was the first uh, book published under the Trump brand. Uh, I think you'll you'll actually find some ideas about negotiation and how you do it and how you pursue it that were in evidence very much in the first Trump term and might help some of us understand a little bit better just how this all works. But I would see that he would be ready to put everything on the table. It will be deeply alarming again to people in Europe because when we say everything, we might mean NATO. He might mean NATO. Uh, but, but putting it on the table doesn't mean you're ready to sacrifice or throw it away or kill it. It's a bargaining technique not necessarily a statement of a bottom line. So, but I would say fasten your seatbelts. So it's a, it's, it's a bargaining technique, potentially about other people's security without them involved in the bargain, obviously. Well, I think, but I, well, I think the bargaining over NATO, for example, would be with Germany and other countries in Europe. So in fact, it wouldn't, it would be, okay. look, you want me to keep protecting you. Yep. You have a long list of things that you say that you want me to do. Uh, what's the list of things that you're prepared to do for me? Right, okay. That would be the question he would, would ask. All the bargaining happens with allies, you know, first at the very least and potentially uh, in the longer uh, point. 
Um, again, I'm looking around, but I didn't see hands go up many more. Okay, yeah, people are getting warmer, but you've only got like three minutes to get warmer Here's in. One. So, yep. <laughs> Please, could you take the mic uh, coming right to you? Just very quickly say who you are. Quick question, thank you. For, for Mr. Baker, you know, the U.S. is a nation of laws, but the Supreme Court doesn't have an enforcement arm. And the argument is that Congress impeaching the president is the only backstop. So how do you see that actually playing out, given Mr. Roberts' response? Yeah, I mean, there, there, that, you know, the, and there are, there are many concerns, right, which, which I didn't go into. There is the presidential, the use of the presidential pardon, which can be, which, which can have enormous uh, consequences in terms of the enforcement of, of, of criminal law, uh, for criminal federal law. What, as you say, the Supreme Court doesn't have an enforcement mechanism. The accountability process for a president, um, certainly while in office, obviously, is the, uh, is the impeachment mechanism. And again, so I'm, I'm, there will be... <laughs> it will be trouble. There will be more of what we saw the first time around. Trump, remember, was impeached twice. Uh, you know, then there are Republicans who like to impeach Joe Biden right now. You know, Bill Clinton was, was, was I mean, that, that's becoming a sort of a regular, uh, if rather um, futile, um, act of uh, supposed accountability, especially obviously when the Senate doesn't convict. So there will be lots of this kind of storm and stress, I've absolutely no doubt. I think Trump will, and again, as he did in the first term, he will try to press um, certain policies which will be rejected by the courts. And we, the, that happened with a lot of his Im immigration proposals. It's also worth, important to say, you know, even as we express these concerns about the man, you know, Joe Biden has also pursued uh, uh, the use of executive power uh, in ways that have been overturned by the courts. So, yeah, I expect a lot of um, stress to the system uh, with Trump. I expect, you know, the kind of statements he makes today where he seems to imply that he should have absolute immunity for yep. any act whatsoever. <laughs> Famously, was, uh, his lawyer was asked at, a, uh, at, the, uh, at the hearing last week whether that would, whether that, whether that would, that, whether that would extend to him ordering SEAL Team Six to take out his political opponents. Um, you know, there will—I'm not suggesting that will actually happen—but there will be lots of there will be testing, dramatic testing of and, and of the of the stre of the of the of the ability of the United States Constitution and legal system to to bear stress and the guardrails as they talk about it will be challenged. I just, again, I, and this, this may just be naive, I, I just suspect that for all of this stress and for all of the kind of storm and drang around it, the, the, the Constitution is strong enough to ensure that a president actually is, is not able to act Very, in, yeah. in, 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 in autocratic ways. Sorry. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, core point. Um, let me give an opportunity. I want to give, I'll give you each a chance to say one more thing. First, Rob is going to come in a bit on Ukraine okay. and, and any of those other points that came up here. I would just say that, interestingly enough, we talk about people telling the truth and at least not telling the truth. I think that under, well, I know that under President Trump, and you can address it if you want, uh, Kevin, the, the US trade balance went up significantly, um, yes. despite having opposed all the tariffs, saying I'm going to protect the jobs and so on. Um, America's trade deficit got a lot worse. So um, what... I'm going to ask each of you at the end, we've got to give literally a two or three word answer. What would be different about America in 2028 if there's been a Republican administration? Mm. Have a think about it uh, while Rob says something about Ukraine. Okay. And then maybe while he's thinking about Ukraine, showing that he's done both wills, he'll actually have an answer of the 2028 side as well. Or well, I can come back to you at the end if you need more time to think about it. I, I want to hear them. You know, okay, right. Well, I'll give you, let you have the last shot then. Uh, no, just on, on, Ukraine. on Ukraine quickly. I mean, I'm, I'm a strong supporter of Ukraine, as you know. I think it's definitely in our national security interest as Americans for Vladimir Putin not to win. I think if he does win, I think he's on the border. I know he's on the border then of four additional NATO allies, for which we have an Article 5 commitment. And I think we would spend a lot more money, equipment, troops, and so on. <laughs> my concern about Ukraine, my criticism about the current administration's approach to Ukraine is that they're not giving the Ukrainians what they really want and need. So it's the attack on missiles, it's the long-range missiles. Mm -hmm. it, it is the Abrams M1 tanks, uh, happen to be made in Ohio. Uh, it's also the F-16s that uh, countries are ready to provide but need the licensing. Um, those are the things that are either moving very slowly or not moving at all. And there are other air defense systems that they really need and want. And so I think there's another way to look at this, which is that Donald Trump was the first president to provide lethal aid to Ukraine. You recall in the Obama administration, they provided blankets, they provided radios. Uh, the Ukrainians were desperate. And it was Trump who actually signed off on providing that lethal aid. So, you know, you think about the Stinger missiles. Uh, so I'm, I'm not giving up on that. Now, I, maybe I'm naive because you can hear what President Trump uh, says about it today, but there's another approach that Republicans, I think, should be taking, which is that what's currently happening is not effective. And it, I agree, there needs to be a plan. There needs to be a solution. And the solution is, let's go all in. 
And let's be sure that we protect the, interior, the, the territorial integrity of this country because it affects our national security and what we would have to otherwise do. Thank you. Right. Sorry to lose a few folks. I'm over time. I'm going to get killed. Yeah, they really want us to stop. But I've, you've got to do it. Biggest change about America by 2028? Revitalize self-governance for Americans and the rest of the world. Walter? Um, it won't be Trump versus Biden in 2028. <laughs> <laughs> That's a big change. That's a good one. You should have come to you last. I was... No one will admit it, but they'll realize America is a lot more resilient than they realize. Walter stole my line, but I was going to say Americans will be looking for a president who is not going to be in his 80s when he's, uh, when he's president. You know, so. Rob, now they got through very quickly. One yeah, those, were, those were all great. No, I, I think it goes back to the rule of law and the Constitution. I think it will be tested and it will be proven to be resilient. Okay. Thank you very much. Please thank this great panel.